Well, my girlfriend says it's the best deodorant she's ever used, so I need to spread the word. Visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code BRAIN to get 20% off your first purchase. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, like I said, welcome to the show. Um, I want to talk about an email that I received that is meant to inspire. And uh, this is someone that wrote to me last year and said, uh, basically, my life is falling apart. I don't know what to do. I'm pretty much lost. And when I get these emails, you know, that those are loaded. <laughs> those are loaded emails. And there's a lot of energy in there. And, you know, not the positive kind of energy, but the depressed kind of energy, the um, draining kind of energy. It's probably a lack of energy, really. But to get an email like that, it makes you realize how much they're going through. And when you're an empathetic person, your heart goes out to them and you want them to feel better. And, you know, probably 10 years ago, I would be replying to each and every one of these emails, trying to figure out how I could fix them, trying to figure out how I could repair their situation, give them a solution to their situation. Um, not from a place of I'm here to help, but from a place of I need to help. That's a different place. When you come from a space of, I want to help, as opposed to, I need to help, you keep your energy. Not that you can't need to help anyone, but uh, I want you to think about what space you're in when you reach out to help someone. Is it that I need to help? I have an obligation to help. I have a responsibility to help. I'm not saying these are bad things. I'm just asking you to inquire within do some introspection, some reflection on your past and ask yourself, when I help others, am I doing it because I want to? And it feels good and it energizes me. And there's especially no resentment that I did it. I talk about people pleasing a lot. That's where I'm going. When you want to help someone out of a need, out of a strong desire or an empathetic urge that you must do it and attached to that empathetic urge is a strong desire for some sort of reciprocation or some sort of acknowledgement or validation that someone likes you, that your happiness depends on their validation of your help or their reciprocation where now that you've done them a favor, you feel great when they reciprocate and do you a favor too. Now, these are part of the people-pleasing structure and model that I talk about a lot. We're not going to talk about people-pleasing too much in this episode, but I wanted to just pose that question before we begin. Not that it's going to be related, but um, it just came up. It just came up now. <laughs> As I was talking about this, it just came up. When I was well, about 10, I think that's too soon, maybe 15 years ago. About 15 years ago, when I was doing the people-pleasing, when I was always seeking the attention of others by helping, by saying yes to everything, by dishonoring my boundaries so I could honor theirs, by draining my energy so I could give them energy, by doing that over and over again, no wonder so much of what I did in my life failed. No wonder so many relationships burnt out. No wonder I couldn't keep a job. And it wasn't because everyone else was the problem. It was me pouring too much energy into the people I was with and the places I frequented, you know, work especially. And when you pour your heart and soul into other people and into places and you don't have much left for yourself, 
you are drained. And your only energy source comes in the form of, I hope they return the favor. You don't probably use those words. I didn't use those words. I just felt like I invested into this. I invested into you. Where is my return? Where is my ROI, my return on investment? And I held on to that feeling as I went through life. And that's what caused resentment and burnout. And so I'm just posing that question as an unrelated side note of this episode, just in case you might be carrying around this people-pleasing mentality. Uh, Again, I talk about people-pleasing in other episodes, and it is a bigger umbrella of a behavior that you might want to look at in yourself if you find yourself doing it a lot. It can happen every now and then, and it's not a big deal. You might get drained every now and then, but as long as it's not a regular thing, then, you know, that probably doesn't bother you. If it's not broken, don't fix it. If it's not bothering you day to day, don't worry about it. But if it's a continuous source of stress or strife in your life, and you find that the more helpful you are to people, the more you feel drained, then you're doing it wrong. I know, I'm going to just say it, you're doing it wrong. You should want to do it. It should be something that comes from an abundance, uh, extra reserve of energy, instead of, I am giving you all I have now. When it comes from a place of, I just have enough for me, and I'm going to give it to you, that's when the burnout and the resentment and a passive-aggressive nature kicks in, your emotional triggers kick in, and suddenly you're creating your own toxic environment. Believe me, I've seen the nicest, kindest, most generous people get thrown to the curb because people couldn't stand them anymore. Because people who have healed and people who notice toxic behavior, they don't like it. They don't want to be around it. Even though, like a people-pleaser, is going to show up as the kindest, most generous, supportive person ever. The people that recognize it don't like it. They want to see the authentic person. They want to see the person get upset. They want to hear the real opinion instead of the agreeing opinion. They want to see the person underneath the exterior that's being shown. And I think that's an important point to remember is that when we show up as anything but our true selves, with our own opinions, with our own likes and dislikes, that healthier people will see right through us. And healthier people are those that have gone through healing or haven't had too much dysfunction in their life where it caused them to have altered perspectives and altered realities and toxic behavior themselves. There are people that haven't had too much dysfunction and can see it. And then there are people in my belief, that have gone through a lot of dysfunction, a lot of toxic relationships, a toxic upbringing, and once they've gone through a lot of personal growth and a lot of healing, they suddenly see the behavior that they know is toxic and they stay away from it. And so this is why um, some people pleasers will be so confused because why would they leave me? Why would that person be mad at me? Why would they fire me? I'm the nicest person on earth. I'm speaking from personal experience. I used to think that I'm the nicest person on earth. No one would ever leave me or fire me. Now, I will say that that being a people pleaser at work was beneficial. It still burnt me out, but it was beneficial in climbing the ladder. It was easier to climb the ladder when you're the yes person. And uh, I'm not suggesting that. I think you're better off showing up with boundaries, with your own opinions, even if it disagrees with the boss. I think it's healthy to do that. And when I started changing my people-pleasing ways and showing up as my authentic self, I found that I still climbed the ladder and got promoted and was respected and admired. In fact, even more, when I stopped being the people-pleaser, I was more admired, more respected, and was more likely to get the promotions and the raises because they could trust me more. It's hard to trust the yes person. It's a lot easier to trust a person that says no sometimes. It's a lot easier to trust the person that has an opinion. Because when you agree with everything that everyone does and says, you don't always get looked upon highly. So I'm just throwing that out there in case anyone's in this situation 
where they're showing up as always people pleasing, always accommodating, always being submissive. It's not the healthiest thing because you end up getting burnt out. And again, I've talked about people pleasing on other episodes. So tune into those because right now I'm going to read you that letter of inspiration. Like I said, that was kind of a side note. This person wrote to me, like I said, last year, uh, way back in January, actually, uh, I'm going to call him John. He said, you know, I'm on the brink of losing everything. I've been diagnosed with social communication disorder as well, which is similar to Asperger's. My wife has been unhappy with me for years for many reasons. I'm defensive. I dismiss her. I don't know how to comfort her, and I fail when I try. I tend to miss a lot of details, and she has to follow up with her questions frequently. And I lack a lot of self-confidence, and I'm prone to depression. Uh, It sounds like your wife told you all of this, like she was telling you, here's the list of things that you do to me. Um, not sure. I didn't really clarify that with John, but that's what it looks like. Uh, he says, I think my wife just hasn't seen changes and she's just not wanting a future. If I'm not able to improve in my weaknesses, my disorder makes all of this even more difficult for us on top of everything. We own a business together and it took a huge financial hit. And I think we're going to lose it this year. There's all sorts of collateral and personal guarantees mixed into the debt of the business as well. We have a lot of pets together and I'm afraid that we're going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my wife. I don't know what's going to happen to our pets. I just don't know what to do. And so, you know, that was it. (laughs) That was the email I got. And that, like I said, that's loaded. That's a lot going on there. Uh, Now, there are probably ways to break this down and figure out some root causes of what might be going on here. And if I was working with John one-on-one, that's what I would do is find out some main root causes of what started all this of what could have led to the breakdown of things getting worse and worse. But I never had a chance to write back until many months later. In fact, when was it? It was four months later, around April. And um, I wrote back and said, you know, I'm sorry. I haven't had a chance to reply to you. I want to address this on a show pretty soon. And he wrote back and said, thanks for reaching out. Things are better in some ways and the same in others. We did lose our business. And we've also filed bankruptcy to discharge our liabilities and personal liabilities to the business and our personal debts. It's actually a huge relief not to have the burden of the business on us now. I totally understand that. I get that. We are both looking at career changes and are excited about them. Additionally, we're looking to move out of where we are sometime this year and move back to where I am further south like you. We'll have a better quality of life there and ample job opportunities there when we increase our skill sets. I'd say where it is is the same issues between us. We did have an emotional bonding moment when she said that I am her only family, which has improved our interactions. Although there's no real romance between us right now, I'd like to rebuild something and rebuild my confidence. I'm excited about the direction of our new life, but unsure of how to rekindle any romantic feelings. So this is kind of the um, sequence of events that's happening, and I'm just reading this to get to the rise and fall or the fall and rise of what John's going through here. So far, it's a little bit inspirational, but it's also a little bit still, you know, things are going on. And so I wrote back and I said, hey, thanks for the update. I'm glad to hear that things are better, though there could still be improvement in the area of romance. And I decided to create a patron episode on rekindling romance for you. Oh, that's right. I did create a patron episode on that. If you're on the patron program, it's called How to Rekindle the Romance in Your Relationship. Um, If you're not, you can check it out at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And I said, thank you for the update. I appreciate it. And I wish you the very best. So uh, John wrote back, thanks for the response. I'll listen to it. I do know if there's a rekindling of romance, eventually we'll go our separate ways. It's hard to think about that, but I find your show very comforting. It's better than therapy for me because expressing myself is difficult. My disorder is like Asperger's, so I deal with some limitations. When listening to your show, there's no pressure for me to interact. And I just listen. Thanks again. And then he wrote back again and said, um, my wife and I are divorcing. She's met someone else. I found your latest post, should you leave your partner, very relevant. And it's all much easier to accept and see with things being over. Good news is we're not fighting each other and it's an amicable split. Thank you for your podcast. I'm getting to the last email momentarily, but that was last June. And so now we're in June 2019. And it's been a year. I hadn't talked to John at all. And I decided to reach out and ask him, wanted to follow up and how, ask how things are for you. I hope things are better. I've had this in my inbox a while and I, I finally got a chance to follow up. Yes, it does take me a year sometimes. <laughs> and uh, thank you for sharing uh, what's going on in your life. And uh, John wrote back. 
And this is where I'm taking you today. This is the inspiration because I receive a lot of emails and a lot of people that have gone to therapy, have talked with counselors, have talked with best friends, have talked with life coaches, have listened to podcasts, have read books, have done everything. And usually the people that write to me, I'm their last ditch effort. (laughs) I don't know if I should take that as a compliment or I do. I do take it as a compliment, but it's usually because they hadn't heard my show yet or they think, you know, therapy is going to be the route that they need to take. Often it is, sometimes it isn't. But when I get some of these emails, it is usually I'm in the lowest place possible. I don't know what else to do. And so um, I have a lot of episodes on finding purpose, finding happiness, finding joy when everything's falling apart. Uh, And I highly recommend if you're listening to this and you're in that space, you go to my website, theoverwhelmedbrain.com. You type in the word purpose. You type in the word meaning, you know, in the search field on the right. You type in the word, what's the point? There's an article I wrote or a podcast that I created called, What's the Point of Life Without Joy and Happiness or something like that. And uh, I talk about those things. They're the bigger existential uh, questions and reflections on life that are important to take in if you're in that space. Because I've been there. I've been completely depressed. I have felt suicidal. I've been in the lowest space I could possibly imagine. And I believed that there was never, ever going to be happiness in my life again been there a couple times in my life. And when you're in that space, your mind is very clouded and you cannot see a positive future. You cannot possibly imagine that things are ever going to get better. I've been there and I know many people, maybe you listening right now have been there or are there now. And I'm here to say stories like John's, and I'm going to read you his final email in a moment, and stories like mine and stories like many hundreds, thousands of people that I've talked to or heard from or read their stories. So many of them went from that dark space and they knew there was no way out. They knew there was no hope. They knew they would never be happy again. And they knew their life could never improve. They went from that space into a better space and sometimes fully healed, fully happy, whether they're in a new relationship or not, whether what they hoped would happen happened or not. People went from the darkest spaces to a bright new future, to a bright new outlook. And I know there are people listening right now saying, I'll never experience that. It's been 20 years, Paul. I'll never experience that. It's not going to happen. And I'm here to say that I've seen way too many people get out of the dark space. Yes, even after 20 years of misery, I've seen it happen. Often it happens when we get rid of the thing that makes us miserable that can make you less miserable. When you've got a 20-year relationship that makes you miserable and you think life is never going to get better, sometimes you need to get out of the relationship or at least start standing up for yourself and say, no, I won't take this behavior anymore. I won't sit back and watch myself get treated that way. may sound a little odd to say that. You may not say those words, but if you say them in your head, I won't sit back and allow myself to get treated that way. It might change your approach. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying you change your thinking from I'm so miserable, there's nothing I can do to, you know what? I'm sick of being treated the way I'm treated. I'm going to stand up and do something about it. It's definitely a different approach. I'm not saying it's the solution that's going to solve everything, but it's a good start. It's a good start to stand up for yourself and do something for yourself and get rid of whatever toxic elements are in your life so that you can take care of yourself. Because a lot of people don't show up in the way they're supposed to show up for you. There's a lot of marriages that I hear about that the person's spouse doesn't support them, doesn't show up for them, puts them down, insults them. And the person writing to me says, I'm sick of this. How can I stop him or her from doing that to me? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it it takes an acceptance of what is so that you can take the next step for yourself. There's a lot of ways this can branch out into a whole different conversation, but I'm going to keep this more focused, come back to John's final email to me, which was today. I decided to just read it on the air today. He says, hi, Paul, thanks for following up. And this is again, like a year later. I'm in a much better place these days. 
I was burned out working in my industry after losing my business. I felt like I really had nothing going for me since I was only, and he tells me what job he had, and I only had this uh, associate's degree that I hadn't used in 10 years, so I really had no experience going for me in that realm. I was looking to completely change directions. I moved back to the south where I'm from and I lived with my parents. I kept getting rejected where I applied for work. I ended up going back to work in the industry I was in before. And as I worked there, I saw familiar faces of those that were still working there. And they had a laid back environment. It was so unlike where I used to live. I got back into what I used to do and I picked up client after client. And now I have 25 plus active clients And I realized how good I actually am at my job because losing my business and my marriage and feeling useless made me think I wasn't anything special and in fact, a loser. So I primarily focused on my industry and the very specific things I need to do to become better at my work. And I've been in school again since the new year with fantastic grades as I complete the prerequisites to enroll in a program I'm looking forward to. To top it off, I met a girl who works at the same place, and we've gotten into a much healthier relationship than I had with my ex-wife, and I'm so much happier and supported than I was before. I also feel much stronger and happier having hit the rock-bottom feeling and climbing back out. I don't really listen to your show these days, but it's highly recommended to others if they're going through a hard time. I mostly listen to news, conspiracy, and comedy podcasts while I drive around in my new car. My credit is improving and everything is just on the way up for me. If you do speak about this in your podcast, please send me a link. You are very helpful and I listen to you constantly because I was hurting and alone for quite a while. John. John, thank you so much for this update. I wanted to read this on the air for a couple reasons, maybe a few reasons, but I am just so grateful that you wrote all of this to me, that you shared it with me. And it makes me feel good to receive emails like this of how your life went from uh, being so dismal, being so depressing into something like this, which is amazing. So you are amazing, John. You did a lot of work. I was there to help guide in some ways, but you did all the work. You did everything that um, helped you, like you said, climb out of rock bottom. I love it. And so one of the reasons I read this email is because of one of the things that you said, which is, uh, and I'm just going to pinpoint this for a second. I don't really listen to your show these days, but it's highly recommended to others if they're going through a hard time. I think when you get to a point where you don't need to listen to my show anymore, that's an improvement. (laughs) I think it is. I think when you get to the point where I don't need what you talk about anymore, then you're in a good space because I talk about a lot of hard stuff. And a lot of people listening right now, they want to get to that point. They want to get to where you are. That's another reason why I'm reading this is because where you were, John, I mean, you felt like a loser. You felt like you could not be successful because of your disorder, uh, because you had something that was like Asperger's. You felt like your, your limitations were causing what was happening to you, or at least a part of what was happening to you, an element of what was happening to you. When in reality, what it seems that you're finding out is it's not so much your limitations, it's that you're surrounding yourself with more supportive people and a better environment and and taking that old saying that wherever you go, there you are and throwing it out the window (laughs) because that's what I believe. I believe that wherever you go is a new chance to be a new person. It is a new chance to meet new people, to find more supportive people, to be around people that respect you and want to see you happy and want to see you improve wherever you want to improve. And sometimes you do need to change your environment. Sometimes you need to move a thousand miles away. And when you do that, you have a whole new opportunity to be a new you. Because it is hard to be a new you when you're around the old environment, the old people, you know, the same old people. Not that they are necessarily hindering you, but that you are allowing them to hinder you. Like I was saying earlier, it's better to be in a space of, no, I won't accept that behavior instead of, okay, I guess I have no choice but to accept that behavior. Or even in a space of, okay, I keep failing here. It must be my fault. Yes, you have a responsibility in the decisions that you make and how your life turns out. And sometimes you have to take a bigger step 
into that responsibility so that you can make changes that you need. But it's not just your fault. Sometimes we are programmed to think that it's our fault because of a condition that we have, because of our emotional state, because we had a bad past or a traumatic past. Sometimes we are led to believe that we are the problem when it turns out we have a solution that we just haven't applied to the problem. So yes, we can exacerbate the problem. We can enable the problem. We can continue being in the problem. But sometimes we have a solution that maybe we're too afraid to apply or maybe we don't believe the solution will work or maybe we just don't know we have the solution or don't believe there is one. And John, where you were, it sounded like you didn't believe there was one. My life is pretty terrible. My business is falling apart. My wife is leaving me. And I know a lot of it is because of who I am and how I'm showing up. No, it's not. And I think you're finding this out because how you show up changes when you get out of situations that aren't really complementary to you. And I think you're finding this out because I bet that you can now show up more authentically even with this disorder that you, that you have. And the people that love you and support you and are complementary to you aren't holding it against you, aren't blaming it. They're working with it. They're working with you. Forging closeness and bonding in your relationship intimacy that you didn't have before. And you probably wouldn't have had because you weren't in the right environment around the right people. So John, your letter is an inspiration. And I want to thank you for sharing this because there are people listening right now, and I've been in this space too, that really believe it's never going to get any better than it is. And I've seen this over and over again. Anyone from their 20s, 30s, 50s, 70s, 80s, I've seen people in the entire range of ages that you could be have a life change that they never expected and they didn't think was possible whether because they think they were too old or if things could never change or they were too broke or they just knew for other reasons that it just wasn't going to happen, that their life was never going to get any better. I see it all the time. And one of the main reasons I'm reading this series of emails, John, is because people need to know it's possible. They don't want to just hear, you can do it. You got this. Just wait another year and things will change. They don't want to hear that crap. (laughs) They want to hear Someone's actual success story. And I bet you there was a lot that went on in between this month and last year around the same time. I'm sure there was a lot going on. I'm sure there was a lot of challenges. But it sounds like you decided to take big steps for yourself. And because of that, big changes happened. I think it's when we take the small steps, the ones that if we took a bigger step, that's too much into the unknown. So we don't want to go that far. I think when we take those kind of small steps, because if we take a bigger step, we might fall into the unknown, that we end up with very small changes, if any, in our life. I'm not saying all the time, but this is what's happened in my life, is that the small steps I've taken, they just seem so passive. They just seem completely almost useless when I take them. Because I used to think, okay, this small step toward honoring myself by me being passive aggressive and hoping the other person gets what I'm trying to say is a step in the right direction. You know, this is my logic back then, but uh, it didn't seem to improve the relationship at all. In fact, it seems like it's worse now. Sometimes I've had those moments where, well, I'm just going to be passive aggressive here and just say something like, well, somebody has to empty the trash. You know, that's kind of a passive aggressive comment because I want so-and-so to empty the trash just for an example. And they don't empty the trash. And uh, why didn't they? Why couldn't they hear my words? Why didn't they get the message? Well, because I wasn't direct. I can blame myself for that, even though they probably heard exactly what I was saying, but was ticked off the way I said it. And so this is one of those big steps. Well, if if I'm direct, they could be confrontational. They could yell at me. What if I'm direct? That's so scary. That's a big step. It's a big step into the abyss. I bet you you took a few of those steps, John. And, uh, you know, of course it still takes baby steps. You know, you got to wait to find out what happens. But I don't want, for anyone listening now, every step to be a baby step. When the steps are a little bit bigger, a little bit scarier, something that you know you don't know the outcome to, maybe that's the step you need to take. 
There's a lot of variables here, I know, but I just want you to start having that mentality that sometimes it takes a little bit bigger steps, ones that you're uncomfortable with, stepping into the discomfort zone so that you can see some real changes in your life. John, I see some real changes in your life. I love them and I wish you the best. And don't worry, I won't require you to listen to this show ever again, but tune in if you need it because I talk about the big steps all the time. And sometimes it's necessary if you want real change in your life. Thanks for sharing your big changes, John. I appreciate you. We'll be right back. I said it at the beginning of the show, and I'm going to repeat it here. My girlfriend loves native deodorant. I didn't know she was going to love it this much. She loves it. It stays on all day, even after she sweats in the garden and comes back in. And uh, uh, between you and I, she doesn't stink. <laughs> but she uses this deodorant every day now. And uh, she has been looking for something without all the extra ingredients that can cause problems. I mean, I speak from personal experience here. I've seen her break out with other deodorants. I've seen rashes form where she uses her deodorant and it doesn't happen with native. And that's a huge plus because I know there are a lot of people out there that are sensitive to deodorants and other personal hygiene products. Native is formulated without aluminum, parabens, and talc. It's filled with ingredients found in nature such as coconut oil, an antimicrobial, shea butter, which is a moisturizer and emollient, and tapioca starch, which absorbs wetness. Perfect. Both my girlfriend and I love that there's no animal testing. It's hard to find products that don't do that nowadays, but, uh, you know, it's happening more and more in the world, and Native's at the front line of that, so the no animal testing is a huge thing in our household. And it simply works. Native can hang with your workout. Whether you're a busy mom or you're one of those people that works 16 hours a day, Test it out. It works. It works for us, and I know it's going to work for you. With over 7,000 five-star reviews appearing in the Today Show, Women's Health, Good Morning America, a whole bunch of places, and ingredients you know, you know, less ingredients is often more, and that's what Native does. They have fewer, simpler ingredients so that you know everything that's in their deodorant. It's worth it. And there's something for everyone. It comes in a wide variety of enticing scents for men and women, plus they release all new limited edition seasonal scents throughout the year. So there's no risk to try. They offer free returns and exchanges in the U.S. And I think, yeah, free shipping. They have free shipping as well. Plus, they have a very convenient money-saving subscription model that I want you to check out as well. Go to nativedeodorant.com. Use the promo code BRAIN during checkout, and you'll get 20% off your first purchase. I tell you what, there's something to be said when my girlfriend comes out of the bathroom and says very loudly and very early in the morning, I love this deodorant. So (laughs) I want you to check it out. Go to nativedeodorant.com, use the promo code BRAIN during checkout, and get 20% off your first order today. Welcome back. Uh, One of the reasons I wanted to bring up that email in the last segment is because it's sort of related to the last newsletter I put out regarding the ebb and flow of life. You know, this is kind of one of those personal growth 101 comments and philosophy and things like that, where, you know, life is going to send you a bunch of positive stuff and then life's going to send you a bunch of negative stuff. And then hopefully you find that balance uh, between those things. And hopefully life sends you more positive than negative. And for the most part, it does. You may not think that, but when you can look at life as, hey, I have all my needs met today and I have them all met the next day and I have them all met the next day. And then the following day, the worst kind of thing happens. And we look at all the worst things that could happen as a tiny little percentage of them actually happening. Whereas 95% of the time, I've got all my needs met. But the problem is we carry around the 5% of the misery or the negativity as if it were happening all the time. You know, we carry that in the form of stress and anxiety and depression and uh, other states of mind and other emotional states 
that um, cause us to feel like life is miserable. Because right now you're probably listening to this and it's probably unlikely that you are in a suffering state in this moment. Like if we look at the very essence of the present moment and there is no past and there is no future and all you have is right now in this moment listening to my words, listening to this show, you're probably not in a suffering state. You might be. You might have physical pain. You might have other things going on. But is this the high percentage of suffering that you might carry around with you at any other time? Or is this just a tiny little percentage of what's happening? I'm not speaking for everyone. Some people might be suffering as we speak. But in this moment, is that person yelling at you? In this moment, Are you under stress at your job or in your relationship in this very moment? What's happening besides just listening to this show? You might be in your car. You might be doing your laundry. You might be walking around or on a treadmill. How are you suffering right now? And so a lot of people can answer that. I'm not really suffering right now, but I carry around this burden of suffering. I carry around this pain. I carry around this hurt, these emotional wounds, this fear of what's going to happen tomorrow, this anxiety of what's going to happen tomorrow, and the pain of the past. That's what we do when we're outside of the present moment, is that we find everything else to feel bad about, and we stuff it all in to the present moment and think that it's happening now. We're reliving it like a post-traumatic stress response. I still have pain from the past, therefore I feel it now. I still have fear about the future, therefore I feel it now. And that's not really present moment thinking. Present moment thinking, and this is my personal go-to when I want to be in the present moment, is I have the visualization that the world is going to end tomorrow, or even tonight, or I'm going to be very present-minded knowing that there is no future. This may not work for you. It works for me. I think that the world is going to end. There is no future. Huh. That's a different feeling. If I can put myself in that state just by having that single thought, then maybe that's a healthy thought to have. But that's a morbid thought to have. <laughs> it, it can be. But if there's no bill that I have to pay next month, or tomorrow, if I don't have to worry about going in and getting yelled at by my boss tomorrow or next week, if I don't have to worry about anything that's coming because nothing will be here, that's a different state of mind. And this is just a visualization. This isn't me telling you to do anything drastic. That's not what this is about. You know, we want a future that changes. When you're in the ebb, the flow is around the corner. When you're in the valley, the peak will arrive. It's just that sometimes the valley lasts years. Sometimes the valley, it feels indefinite. It feels like never ending, but it does end. And sometimes it does take that bigger step into the unknown, into the abyss that causes changes that really propel us forward, that really give us momentum, that really make life better. But we carry around fear from the past. Okay, let's work this in reverse. What if there was no past? What if today you arrived on the planet? You showed up. You blinked into existence. No past. That's a different feeling too. You can put those both together. There's no past. And today is the only day that you're here. Because there's no future either. What's that feel like? No past. You mean that thing never happened to me? You mean I don't have to carry that around? You mean I don't even know who bothers me anymore because I never met them? What is that like? Where do I even begin with that? Your mind is so empty that you can see infinite possibility. What would you do if today was the day that you had to experience? Like an insect. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now I'm devolving you. <laughs> I'm not saying you're an insect, but an insect only has a few days to live. Some insects. 
they arrive, they do their thing, and then they're gone. They probably don't have all the worries that we have. Maybe it's because we live longer. The worry builds up. The fears build up. And we have no way to flush them out of our system because we have such a long life. But really, right now, we're okay. Today, right now. Because I can't imagine that you'd be listening to this if you were on the edge of Mount Everest on an ice wall (laughs) trying to get up the edge and you need all your focus, all your concentration, and you are basically risking your life. I can't imagine somebody is in that kind of state. Or you're listening to this and someone's abusing you. I can't imagine that's happening right now. I'm just mentioning these states just to kind of relate to what some people might experience in their everyday life. You know, there are times when suffering arrives. And when we're in the suffering, it doesn't feel good. We don't want it. We hope it goes away. And when it goes away, there's another moment in time. And these are the moments that we can allow to add up. This one moment where there is very little or no suffering. So I'm talking a little bit of Buddhism here. I'm talking a little bit of Eckhart Tolle. And certainly I highly recommend you listen to Eckhart Tolle. If you want to learn more about the present moment, he's kind of the master with that. Uh, But he is a great inspirational story too. If you've ever read Eckhart, I've read two of his books, and I used to listen to a lot of his YouTube uh, videos. He has a great inspirational story because I think while he was in college, he became incredibly depressed. He really believed that there was just no way out of it, and he couldn't stand it, and he didn't know what to do. And uh, he talks about how he was able to separate himself from the depression. And that's pretty cool. You know, I talked about uh, dissociation on this show before where you can separate yourself from the part of you that's experiencing the pain or the hurt or the the fear or the anxiety or the stress. And you can get good at that. This dissociation where you can see yourself over there having the issue. It's a much different feeling. All of these little techniques give you a different feeling. And that's what I mean by um, what you carry around most of the time is uh, if you're carrying around a lot of fear or pain or anxiety that um, we need to give ourselves a break from that. We may not believe it'll ever go away, but why not give ourselves a break? You know, my girlfriend says that um, music helps her when she gets depressed. Listening to songs that connect her emotionally, listen, listening to songs that uplift her. The thing is, she has a hard time getting into the space to actually play the music. Even though she knows it will help, there's a part of her, and I think this happens with a lot of people, including myself, there's a part of us that almost wants to own this feeling. It's like we have to experience it. If we let it go, then we're saying that it doesn't exist. And maybe by saying it doesn't exist, that we're taking the blame away from where it should be or who it should be pointed to. There's all kinds of reasons we might want to own it. And we might have to take a big step toward helping ourselves in the moment. Helping ourselves toward feeling better. Even if it's just for 15 seconds. Just to get a taste of what it's like. If we have no taste of what it's like, we don't ever expose ourselves to something better. And if we never expose ourselves to something better, something healthier, something more positive, will think that this is all there is and there'll never be anything better. And when we carry that around, it's hard to develop hope. It's hard to connect to faith that things will work out. It's hard to access logic that tells you that, hey, things have worked out before. They'll work out again. And it's not like I'm a master at this. I mean, this takes effort. This takes practice. This takes when you're in a bad space to say, I want to get into a better space. And then referring to a list of things that make you feel better. Oh yeah, music makes me feel better. I'm glad I wrote that down because I would never have thought about that while in this bad space. So that might be something you do. When I'm in a bad space, here's my list. Because when you're in that good space, you can think more clearly. The fog lifts and you think more clearly. This is why when I get the rare email that says I'm suicidal, Thankfully, I don't receive too many of those, but I do get them. 
I'm suicidal. I don't know what to do. I will say, your mind is clouded and I know it's clouded. And when the fog lifts, you'll be able to see better decisions for you. And I could say, I know it's clouded because when it's not clouded, we make healthier choices for ourselves. We make choices that move us toward life and living. Even if it's hard, even if there's challenge, we move toward that. And I also address that they might be holding on to something that they need to get out of their system. They might be holding on to the pain or the regret or the resentment or the anger and they need to tell someone about it or they need to do something about it. We hold on to things for so long that it creates a depression inside of us, that it gives us these thoughts that maybe we should do something drastic. And I'm here to say when the fog is there, you just don't think straight, which is why it's probably important to have a list of things that help you think straight, that help you get a little bit clarity again, even if it's just for 15 seconds, just to give you a taste of the direction that can compel you to improve, to feel better inside yourself. So that's what I want to share with you today. I want to thank John for writing and uh, keeping me up to date with what was going on in his life. Thank you, John. And I want to thank you for listening to the show, sharing this space with me and continuing to move forward, continuing to give yourself momentum so that you can create the life you want. I say that at the end of every show. I want to help you create the life you want. And I'm going to say it again later. Thanks again for joining me. We'll be right back. Say some thank yous and goodbyes and my final words after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you to go to my girlfriend's favorite deodorant website, <laughs> nativedeodorant.com, and use the promo code BRAIN to get 20% off your first purchase. Highly recommend them. Love what they offer there, and we use it in this house. So I'm speaking from experience. Nativedeodorant.com. And I want to thank the supporters of The Overwhelmed Brain, those who have joined the patron program over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. I especially want to thank Shannon, who uh, wrote to me and joined the program this week. Thank you so much for your support, Shannon. I am so grateful and for your words and your email to me. I am very touched. Thank you so much. And I thank everyone in the patron program. If you're in the program, then you know that you have access to all the workbooks and discounts on my coaching and discounts on some of the programs that I offer, like um, the Safe Empowerment System for Social Anxiety. Uh, you can check that out at quietbegins.com or you can join the patron site and get a little discount. You heard that here. I don't think I've ever said that on the air, but you can do that if you're in the patron program at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Thank you, patron supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you. Also want to remind you to check out Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. That is a podcast I do for difficult relationships, not only romantic, but, you know, relationships with uh, difficult family members. And there's a lot of emotional abuse that goes on that nobody really understands, that they don't realize how much emotional abuse there actually is going on. And for the longest time, I did not think that I was being emotionally abusive when I was married. And uh, I didn't even think the word abuse would even enter my thoughts in our marriage because abuse, that sounds so awful. But the term emotional abuse is a big umbrella term that talks about a lot of, you know, toxic behavior that can really cause the relationship to become complex, difficult, unmanageable, and pretty soon it goes downhill and nobody can figure out why. And that's all part of what can happen when you have an emotional abusive relationship. So if you think that your relationship is way too difficult, whether it's a romantic relationship or with someone in your family or someone else you know, then I highly recommend you listen to Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. And uh, also check out the Mean Workbook, which has an assessment to tell you if your relationship is emotionally abusive. And the assessment is also part of a bigger workbook that helps you um, heal and grow from the toxic relationship. So check it out at loveandabuse.com. And finally, I want to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And as we close the show, I want to kind of reference back to what I said earlier about uh, big steps lead to bigger results as opposed to small steps that sometimes lead to results and sometimes they don't. And um, maybe to think about this in another way, you can take a big step 
and still not get a big result because the kind of step you took may not have been what I might call an active step. Like if you were to differentiate between a passive step and an active step, you might get very different results. And let me just explain this. So let's just say that you wanted to get a raise at work and you wanted to convey that message that you wanted a raise. And so instead of going into the, to your supervisors or managers or boss's office, you instead dropped a hint. You said, you know, I've been working here for a few years now and just wanted to let you know how hard I work and I work on weekends and, you know, uh, the pay is great and all, but, you know, I, I'd love to make more. That could be, I mean, that might even be a lot more than some people would say. They might even not even mention pay. They would just say, you know, I've been working here for a few years now and uh, I work a lot of weekends. You know, I, I think you know that, but I'm just kind of mentioning that. <laughs> you might say that in hopes that someone will recognize that, oh, this person deserves a raise. This is kind of the passive step forward. It could be a very subtle message that either A, someone hears and says, oh, you know, that's true. You have been working here a long time and maybe you do deserve some credit. Maybe you do deserve a promotion. Maybe you do deserve a raise. You're, that would be fine if you are around people like that that are really receptive or they're listening for those messages and they say, well, maybe that's true and, and they're conscientious, I guess you could say. That would be great if you worked for somebody like that because they would get the message and maybe you could get what you want, get the raise. But for the most part, I don't think life works well when you do it that way. I, I think what ends up happening is that people who are more passive, there's a tendency to, I might be wrong about this, but resent their passivity, resent their passive nature. Like, why don't you just ask for what you want? I might be wrong about that. I mean, with not with everyone, but like some people will resent that. There's a nature to how someone communicates that can drive some people crazy. Like, why don't you just ask for what you want? Why aren't you just direct? Why do you have to be so passive or subtle or covert? Why don't you just say what you mean? There are people that are going to get annoyed with that. And then there are people that will hear it and like that there's a subtle hint, but there's no confrontational aspect to it. But I think for the most part, the world doesn't work well when people are more passive. That doesn't mean you should be active and cold and direct and aggressive or nothing like that. It's just when somebody shows up in a more direct way that is easily readable and it can be seen from a very self-empowered place. Like if you showed up at work and said, hey, you know, I've been working here a couple of years now and uh, I've worked a lot of weekends and I've put in a lot of time. Um, I would like a raise. That type of direct active communication there's no room for interpretation there's no space for someone to be resentful because you're coming from a very empowered place and speaking from a place of confidence inside of you knowing that not only do you want this but you know you deserve it and you know that they know that you deserve it i think that's a much different place a much more productive place to be even though and this is where the small versus big step comes in, even though it could be a very big step. What does that mean? That means you could ask for a raise and they could say, no, but um, we don't need you around anymore. They could do that. I think the chances are more slim that they'll do that because if you've been working there and you've been busting your butt, they probably want to keep you. But if let's just say that you did ask for a raise and they said, no, we don't need you anymore. I don't even know if that's legal, but if you ask for a raise and they say, no, we don't need you anymore, then you know who they are. And you also know that this place w wouldn't be a place that you'd grow anyway. So, you know, I realize that if you're working paycheck to paycheck, you can't take that kind of risk. It's too risky. At the same time, if you did take that risk, imagine where you'd end up. Well, I might end up homeless. I don't think so. I think if you're a hard worker, you'd probably end up with another job somehow. But even if you didn't, are you willing to continue to pour your heart and soul into something where people really don't want to keep you around and pay you what you're worth? And in this example with where you're asking for a raise, 
if you're busting your butt for someone and you're working hard and you're doing everything you can for the company to help them prosper, to help them profit, to help them grow, uh, and all they say is, well, we don't want to give you a raise. In fact, we've been thinking about letting you go. If your job was that unstable in the first place, then it's a good thing that you did this. So you have control. You aren't surprised. You walk into the office knowing that this could either go one good way or one other way. Then you take that big productive step. I see it as productive. Even if they fired you, I see it as productive. But I can't afford to be fired. I I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my income. I have a family. I have a home. I have this. I have this. Absolutely. But how stable was it? How could you have possibly stuck around or whether they're going to keep you for a few months and then fire you when you're least expecting it. I mean, I like the idea of being in more control of my destiny. I hate to say it this way, destiny. <laughs> I like being in control and controlling some aspect of my life so that I don't walk in one day and there's a, a note on my desk to come see the boss and that was my last day. I don't like that feeling. It's a terrible feeling. So I like to know where I stand. I don't mind, you know, if I was still working for someone else, I'd be like, I don't mind walking in their office and saying, you know, I've been here for a while and I think it's time for a raise. I I think I've proven my worth here. Will you give me a raise? I'm very direct, but I also know that I'm valuable and I want them to know that I know I'm valuable to them. And so again, I'm just using one example of a big step. It is a big step. You could walk in there and you could get fired. But at least you're in control of your fate, your destiny there, and you're going to take the steps that you need to take for you. And then the result that you get puts you on the path to something better. Because if you're working for a company that is that unstable and you're ready to fire you anyway, that's not going to work out for you. It's just not. If they don't value you enough to keep you around just because you asked for something that you deserve, that's probably not the best place to work. Again, I'm using work as as an example, but think about the big steps in life. Think about how the active versus the passive steps. The active could be, hey, this is what I would like. Can you do this for me? Where a passive would be, hey, I've been thinking about, um, you know, going over here and hoping that something happens, but, uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And this is the having faith that someone will pick up your vibe and pick up the subtle cue and hope they get the message and then do something for you. And life just doesn't work well like that. I did that for a long time. I did that for a long period of my life, not asking for what I wanted, not being direct, being very passive, a lot of passive aggressive too. Like when I was upset with someone, I would say things that I wanted them to hear, but not direct like, hey, you're a jerk. I would say things like, you know, it'd be great if somebody else answered the phone around here. I don't even think I was that direct. That's that's almost more direct than the way I used to be. And I just wanted to convey a message, but I didn't want to convey the message. I didn't want to say it directly. And I found that my life was so much harder if I took passive steps versus active steps. So the reason I mentioned passive versus active and big steps versus small steps is that if you can do your best to take active steps, big or small, I think your life's going to turn out a lot better. So passive is indirect. Passive is covert. Passive is hoping they get the message because you're not that assertive or not that confrontational. Whereas active is saying, this is what I want and will you accommodate me? I mean, it doesn't have to be that particular format, but it could be, this is what I'm going to do. And I just wanted to let you know, it could be something like that. It is just a healthy assertion that you take for yourself, because when you show up this way, you are more likely to get what you want in life, create the life you want, control the path, control your outcome and know the results before the results are thrown at you. And life can work better this way. I'm not saying it's always going to work out the way you want it, but what ends up happening is that you get to control so many more elements of your life instead of just waiting and hoping and praying things go your way when there's so many things in the background that could change, that could just affect you, just like walking into a job one day saying you're no longer needed. But if you had walked in a month or a year beforehand and said, hey, you know what? I've been working here for a long time. What are my options as far as um, promotions and raises? I would like to know. 
That might be scary for some people. What? I'm not confrontational. I don't want to have that kind of conversation. But if you don't, then you're sitting there waiting. And sometimes people don't do well waiting. Sometimes they're very stressed. You might be very stressed waiting and hoping things work out for you. It's sort of like in a relationship. Like, hey, what's going on in this relationship? You know, we haven't kissed in a week. How come? What's going on? You know, I want to know. This is not right. Are you upset? Or, you know, did I do something? Did I say something? That's what I used to do when um, my girlfriend and I first got together. She would get upset about something I said or something I did. Because, you know, nothing I did wrong, but I said something that turned her off. Like, oh my God, am I, am I in a relationship with this guy who doesn't care about me? Or, you know, she would have these thoughts go through her head without asking me about them. And she was neither passive or active. She just never asked. She just held it in. And I finally, after the third day, sometimes would be like, what's going on? You don't even look at me. Uh, You barely kiss me. Uh, What's happening? You know, are you upset? And she would finally say, well, you know, I I don't, you know, three days ago when you said this, I'm really upset about that. I'm like, well, why didn't you just say that? And she she would say, I don't know. I I thought it was just something in me. I got to process. I'm like, so you keep me in silence for three days and I don't know what's going on with you. So after several times that happened in near the beginning of our relationship, I finally told her, look, I don't care if you have to yell at me. I don't care if you have to just bite my head off, you know, just be angry. Just don't leave me in silence. Don't leave me wondering what's going on. And she said, really, you, you just want me to yell at you if I'm mad at you? And I'm being, yes, so much better than being in silence and you trying to figure stuff out. I understand that you need processing time, but I feel like I'm completely alone in the relationship and even neglected. I mean, I would be direct with her. And she wasn't used to that because direct meant an unhealthy exchange for her in, in her past, at least. She would be in a toxic relationship and direct meant huge argument, huge fight. And, you know, not being able to get over it for days or weeks. You know, who knows what it was for her, but it certainly wasn't something she practiced. And so I'm not not saying I taught her right or anything like that. I'm saying that we were able to find a way to communicate that was more direct, that was more healthy, that got past the hard stuff faster so we didn't carry around the crap with us. So we didn't carry around the emotional baggage, the emotional wounds. We just brought it up. Let's put it on the table. Let's talk about it and let's get it off our chest so that we can get past it. Because if this relationship is stable and good and worth fighting for, then let's talk about this hard stuff. We're resilient. It's going to last. It's going to make it. You know, a good, solid relationship will make it through this hard stuff. We'll make it through what seems like the confrontational stuff, the assertive stuff. So that's why I am all for the direct approach. It doesn't mean you have to be cold and heartless. It just means you're direct. You know, this is what I feel. This is what I see is going on. Uh, or do you feel the same way? It's a very direct comment and question. But when you're passive and you don't explain things in a way that's um, more clear, more detailed, you're going to get wishy-washy results. And it's hard to know what's going to happen next with wishy-washy results. It's better just to know what's going on and even take the big active steps so that you can really be clear at least a little bit more about your future. doesn't mean you predict the future, but at least you've done your due diligence so that you're not so surprised when things come down the line and you, and you say, where did this come from? How long have you been thinking about this? It's just nice to take those active steps to be one step ahead. It's kind of like preventative maintenance. So maybe this will help with uh, decisions that you're making, things that you're thinking about now. It's certainly helped me in my life. And no matter what's on your mind, whatever problems or challenges that you're dealing with just keep an open mind that'll help you step into your power and be firm and even assertive in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want always take steps to grow and evolve you are powerful beyond measure and above all and this is something i absolutely know to be true about you you are amazing (laughs) 